Thank you very much. Um, when you're coming to the Anglo-Saxon world, you normally you start with a joke at the beginning. I like that very much. But as a German, you start with an apology. So I have to <laughs> stick to my to my stereotypes. And I would like to apologize because this is a work in progress. And um, um, although I'm already here two months, um, this is still I'm still working on this paper. And um, it is on the other side. It is quite interesting for me because it's old stuff. I worked on a similar topic ten years ago, so it's a little bit a ten years later perspective, which maybe this could be quite interesting for you. But um, of course, you will see some of the stuff is. Um, there is always a comparison what was the state of the art 10 years ago and what, what, what is it now. And sometimes you realize that uh, there are not so many changes. There are some changes which are important, but not so many. Uh, so this time on, I'm focusing not so much on the other talks and lectures at the different conferences, which were more on participatory democracy or participatory turn, and not so much on representative uh, democracy and I'm nowadays using a model where this representative democracy model is m less important and uh, other fields of direct demonstrative or um, participation becomes more important and even um, yeah, the deliberative uh, participation becomes more important and uh, I'm focusing nowadays more on online than on offline participation. Okay, so many apologies. Um, when you see the photos here, I um, have on the left side more or less what is a good old what are the good old days of the electoral democracy. Actually, this is also the research project was where I was involved in and where we did surveys. You, on the left side, you see the typical uh, polling station in Germany, an old school. You can still see they were playing theater. There is some there is some part of the decoration at the end, and this is the smell of Rezopal furniture, which is around you. And you know that it's. I think it's everywhere, at least in the OECD countries. You have a similar atmosphere. Not very attractive, but it is very. <laughs> but it is a very, a very, uh, yeah, serious environment. And below that, on the left side, you see, and that was part of our survey, one of the, um, we did exit polls in that polling station, you see one of the typical voters in a rural village. She's not very typical, because she's a little bit an old style. She has, is wearing the traditional costume, the traditional clothes, what you wear in Germany in that area. Actually, it's the area where the brother Grimm made the, the Red Hood story, mm -hmm. and she has Black Hood. <laughs> because red is for younger people, green is for married, and black is for when the, when you are, when the your husband passed away. So she, is, she still has a singing book in the right hand and the ballot paper in that. And she's coming just from the church, and I'm 100% sure I was not in that church. It's a Catholic area, by the way, in a Protestant surrounding Catholic village. And I'm quite sure that the priest, I'm not sure if that still happens, but the priest tells you what to vote for. At least he makes some hints what could be the better choice. More conservative, of course. And actually, this, even in the Nazi Germany, these villages were very reluctant to vote for the Nazi at the beginning. They voted more for the, for the Catholic parties at the beginning, and then they changed quickly some years later. OK, um, this is the good, the good old days. People still have this kind of citizen duty to vote. They go to the polling station, and they vote. Um, and we had, in 72, I think, a voter turnout of around 80%. And it's still around 72, but one reason is that you have this kind of voters who always go to the election, always vote, because they think it's a duty. On the right side, you know, these are um, this is a protest from Florida 2000, and of course we have protests as well in Germany, but there's not so much protest when it comes to the elections, because um, elections in Germany, there is a very high trust in the organization. It's organized by the local government and trust. You won't find demonstration against Electro, uh, for electoral fraud or mismanagement, etc. What I would like to focus today on is um, on one important aspect, which is um, was part of the uh, discussion when it came to democratic innovation in this field. Uh, we started in that time. Um, we started with a, a research project on online voting. Actually, this area, this county where this village is in is the first and only county where there was a 
a, a pilot project on online voting. There was there was some online voting experience at the universities in different other fields for old age people in some cities at the local level, but this was the only one at the I would say secondary election, a local election. It was not binding, and that started a lot of research in Germany on that field. It was around 2000. And uh, we did research on that, but also research on postal voting, because what you realize quite easily, the problems of postal voting are the same like the problems of online voting. There are other problems as well, but one is the secrecy of the ballot, the secrecy of the vote, which is an important aspect. So uh, what I would like to present today is, um, firstly, I, using the, the um, electoral integrity data, I would like to see what countries are introducing postal voting. Are there certain reasons for that? I'm using the data set. It's still a little bit limited. Um, around 90 countries are in. I would, of course, we all would like to have more. But you will see uh, at least that the, these are the only data I could get, proper data. There are some from other institutions, but they are also not very reliable, I must say. So using this data. And um, then I go into six case studies, three from the German-speaking world, Switzerland, Austria, and Germany, and then three from, uh, Anglo from the Anglo-Saxon world, I would say, that is in UK, USA, and Australia. That's the first part. And in the second part, I would like to go and present some data from the exit polls, what we did in, this is only one of the polling station, in some other polling station, focusing on the secrecy of the vote and also on other um, other um, aspects regarding postal voting. So, first block is who implements postal voting, why, and um, here we are. So, First, um, the list of reforms that we were discussing in the 2000s, but we are still discussing, there are some other um, democratic innovations uh, in nowadays, but we had the whole list of different electoral routes which were discussed um, in Europe, but not also only in Europe, in, the, in, the, in Germany and in, all other, in a lot of other countries, from electoral system, from size, from... Uh, age of voting, etc. You will see um, some of the reforms, reforms happened and uh, some are still un, in discussion, especially compulsory voting is now very, there is a big discussion now in Germany. And then there was a discussion what I called electoral infrastructure, which comes from automatic registration to voting on arrest days, then early voting, proxy voting, I will, later on I will define that, and electronic voting machines, cross-linking of polling station, etc., remote internet voting, that was at, the, at, at that time our most important focus. Um, we had with, with Philipp Schmitter, I was in a group where we had, of course, even more instruments. You remember Schmitter was very much on the lottery as well and on some other very fancy, interesting stuff. And we had an article together. It was very, I mean, very interesting. But I must say it was always focusing on one idea, also this reforms. And the driver was always voter turnout. A decline of voter turnout, which could be seen in most countries, especially at the local level, was the driving force. And not so much question of integrity or simplicity or some other question which are always related to democratic reforms when it comes to the electoral process. Um, when it uh, comes to the secrecy of the, vo of the vote, um, there are um, yeah, different channels, very important. One is, um, and you could see here, uh, one is it's more or less a split, or everything on the right side in this field, uh, the secrecy is placing a very important role. So from internet voting, uh, there were, in, especially in the UK in 2001, there were a lot of uh, experiments on SMS text voting, telephone voting, interactive digital TV voting, but um, also this kind of um, um, not controlled environment, which is always a problem for the secrecy of the ballot, is um, happening when you have early voting, when you have uh, postal voting, and of course also when you have proxy voting. So um, the voter interference, the problem of coercion, uh, the family vote or group vote um, is very much related to all these uncontrolled electoral environments on the right side.
coming now to the uh, to the data from um, first to the definition and then to the data from the uh, electoral integrity program expert data from 19 different countries between five and 30 um, experts were involved and the problem is here when you have this data set um, the they the expert were asked is it existing and they could they, they had the, um, the possibility to to have a scale from one to five, but what, when it when it comes to questions like postal voting, for example, there are, there is a different. Um, it's a very tricky indicator, a tricky a variable, because you may have countries where you or states in the U.S. where you have all postal voting, such as, for example, Oregon. As I know, I think that's the only um, state which has that. But all postal voting was also in the U.K. during that um, was very interesting experiment with a lot very high voter turnout in 2002 then you may have postal voting only for a certain group let's say for the military abroad you may have postal voting for citizen abroad and then you may have postal voting with restriction where you had to you got the voter notification you had to say I'm not here I can't uh, I won't be uh, in at the polling station during that day so um, you had to find to give a reason why you were uh, using the postal vote, and finally you may have postal vote without restriction. And I think some of the experts got a little bit confused about all these possibilities, and uh, at the end they ranked the country, and you see it is a quite mixed picture. It is related, there is a, you know, you can see, I think there is a very low, um, um, very, not very uh, significant um, Relation to the to to the wealth of the country to the GDP per capita, but you can see on top and actually I'm focusing on these countries. There is Australia, Germany, United States, Austria. There are countries like Iceland, Slovenia, but also uh, Lithuania, and there are also on top some countries which shouldn't be there. Um, and I think we sh in this case, the the um, the expert should be asked again because there is Zimbabwe is in, but Zimbabwe is a country where there may be postal voting for the military abroad, but it's definitely not for the expatriates in the UK and others because uh, the regime was always very much against this uh, this uh, opening of uh, electoral uh, space and um, allowing expatriates to vote in the Zimbabwean election. The same, by the way, for South Africa. They recently allowed that for the expatriates but there's no postal voting at the um, national level. And um, you have some countries on the bottom, which is quite interesting. You have some countries such as, for example, Chile, also a country which had historically a lot of expatriates, but not allowing postal voting, postal ballots, and also countries like Israel not allowing that. And uh, I, that would be very interesting to focus on these countries which are at the bottom of it and uh, what I am doing it is, um, in the following is I focus with a case study mostly on these uh, countries on top of it. In the middle you have this field where it's not quite sure if they have uh, fully fledged postal voting or not. Okay. Um, coming now first to the um, Postal voting and the uh, the data what we had I used the as co as a, for the regression here I used postal voting as the as a dependent variable and then I used different uh, aspects for example GDP is a richer country introducing it or population size does it make sense in a bigger country and or not so much in or more in a smaller country is density important if you um, I used urbanization and I saw at the end. It's not important, and I think one reason is that it's not urbanization. It's more if you are in a country like Australia, if you have a lot of space in some re very remote polling station, that could be more important. So real density. Is a voter turnout important? It was not. Um, it was more, but it, in the next step I would definitely see if there is a decline of voter turnout as a kind of traumatic experience. Political rights were, was also not important. Freedom House also not presidential representation, which would mean that we probably have more than one election, more elections, or the proportional system is with an, maybe an easier electoral system is also not important um, um, aspect. Also, 
And I haven't uh, checked for compulsory voting for some other, for example, if secrecy of the vote is in the, uh, in the rectory system. But the only aspect which was um, in this regression an important uh, aspect in it's all a limitation, only 90 countries, was uh, the expatriate vote. Those countries who had an expatriate vote, who were very strong in this factor, they had also, um, there was a strong correlation to postal voting and a little bit also for the disabled vote. They had also, but that was not so, such a strong significant uh, factor. So um, the data are, with all the limitation, are leaving us a little bit alone. So I went into the case studies. I don't want to go into the legal debate where what country had it in the constitution and, um, but there are differences. For example, countries like Switzerland, they they have a constitution, but they don't have a constitutional court, but they have a constitution. And they, but they have, their secrecy is not in. The same for the US, I found. In the electoral laws, it may be in, but not in the constitution. Australia, long, I mean, it's also in the electoral law, as I see it. There are some other countries here, Finland is still in France. France was very interesting. They had postal voting until, um, I think the 80s, and then there was a scandal with left-wing uh, postmen who were not delivering the, the, the ballot <laughs> to the, in their constituency and manipulated the result, and that, that, that ended up in a, in, a, um, in a scandal where they abolished postal voting and went to proxy voting. And actually now with the latest presidential election, they even went from one day to the other to the other to um, online voting for the citizen abroad. Um, Germany had it in, in, uh, since 57, but there were two constitutional court cases, uh, very problematic, and the court said it's only allowed as long as it is a minority. But what you see in a country like Germany, you have now 30-40% are using postal voting, especially in the bigger cities. Not in the villages, because there yeah, you have a vote, higher voter turnout mostly, and more pressure, And but in the cities it's very popular. Um, in the UK, you have it since '85 for the vote for the um, citizen abroad, as I uh, see it, and you had a lot of case studies. Um, in Austria, it was made easier in 2007 when they also went to 16, age of 16 as a voting age, and uh, they had already some reforms uh, some years before, but in 2007 they made it much easier. And um, a very interesting case, I think, is Switzerland because they implemented it in '94. One reason is a lot of, not so many elections, but a lot of referendums. And at, you could see '94; it was the turnout was going up, one or two or three percent, in the next election. But then it sta was stabilized at that level. And what you realize is now, now in Switzerland, around 90% or even higher percent, especially in the cities, are using postal voting. So it is a shift. It's not a new, uh, new um, that, that you have new groups coming in, but you have a shift in the ordinary voter. Uh, that's, uh, that's the argument. There are the people's shift from uh, voting at the polling station to postal vote. Yeah, that's um, the, um, you already saw some of the, the legal, fr legal framework. Of course, postal vote and secrecy of the vote is in the um, UN Declaration of Human Rights, Article 21. It's in the Venice Commission 2002. They, they, um, it's always not clear if the secrecy of the vote is more directed towards a secrecy against the state or a secrecy within the family. That's not always 100% clear. Um, what we had in Germany in um, the GDR, there was a, what was called a facultative secrecy, which means everybody was allowed to show what, the, what he was voting for, and that happened, of course. Social pressure was high and political pressure as well, and the people went to the polling station and they said, I vote for the SED and, put, and, um, and um, Put the, put the ballot paper in. And in Germany, that is different. We have an obligatory secrecy, which means you are not allowed to take somebody with you into the polling booth. It will be strictly controlled. And as soon as there are some violations, there are strong penalties as well. 
And uh, also when there are cases, what we have of course, very, very short, small numbers, similar to Australia, cases where people try to sell the, the postal ballot on, on with eBay and other stuff, they are immediately in the news and immediately penalized. So that is, there is, that's not existing more or less. Anyway, what uh, happened during, in the UK, um, and that was a kind of traumatic experience there, during the trials in 2001, 2002, they had a lot of group voting where, um, where in those uh, wards where they had all postal voting, you had a lot of uh, religious groups who tried to vote together, and that was in the news. And you had some cases where, where especially in certain religious groups, where the, the father was more or less uh, forcing the, um, the family to vote in uh, certain directions. Uh, and that was the reason that this, um, from the voter turnout, most successful instrument was uh, was abolished to, uh, uh, some years later, and uh, all postal voting and postal voting was not um, was only is only possible as I understood it for the citizen abroad. Um, okay, this is the first part. Now we are now coming to the second part, to the uh, exit polls. Yeah, these exit polls are typical quantitative survey stuff. I mean, we had um, 2003 and 2013 the same polling station, the same um, yeah, inner city suburbs and the same um, uh, village. Actually, they are all belonging to the city of Marburg, which is a university city, but with typical in the, the inner city was more middle class rich, that polling station. Then we had at the fringes those what Nowadays in Germany is called the precarious group, and they even speak about precarious election because this group, what they say, is not longer voting. Mostly people with a migrational background, lower, lot of unemployment, lower um, levels of education, and uh, it's a mixed picture. But uh, some of these groups are really not longer uh, part of the um, uh, of the elections and. Um, we were in one of these neighborhoods, and the third one was a typical village. Uh, you saw that photo with this old lady, and that was a Catholic. The Marburg city itself is more mixed or more Protestant, in a Protestant city. Um, when it comes to the evaluation, here there are only the two groups, was a Likert scale, five uh, answer possibilities to answer, and I only have the very good and the good here. So. Um, and the data the on top are for 2013, and the blue one is for 23, 2003. Um, you see that postal voting, in when you have this uh, different alternatives, is very much on top of that um, of that list. And you had more than 88 percent in 2003. It's going a little bit down in 2013, but compared to other ways like online voting, early voting um, in the townhouse, we have that as well voting from a polling station, um, from all polling station, which is not existing in Germany, although it was promised 10 years ago. Um, additional polling station in shopping malls also not existing. We don't have proxy voting except some very few cases for disabled people. And we don't have telephone voting and SMS text voting. But you see, uh, the postal voting, which is existing, is very attractive. And uh, it's going a little bit down, but three quarter are still support supporting this postal voting. And um, we, the, a lot of experts are still waiting for the moment where you have, um, where we have a kind of a new um, verdict from the Constitutional Court. But I wonder if that will happen because it is so attractive and it attracts also so many voters that um, they will definitely be very um, hesitant of probably to change that. Coming to the next um, question, that is trust in electoral infrastructure. Here you can see that voting in the police station is the biggest, but also postal voting has a very high uh, and uh, high um, support when it comes to trust. Online voting because of other areas, uh, uh, other aspects. The 2013 was uh, more or less in the d when the discussion on the NSA in Germany was going on. So that it's much more uh, um, people are much more critical when it comes to uh, data security and data safety. And uh, but still, you can see that online voting, a quarter of the population, think uh, trust 
trust this instrument. Uh, this is different to postal voting. Although our post is also partly privatized and we have more and more problems with the post. Um, and we had one um, online voting experiment with a, in, within a church. Also I would call it a kind of tertiary election as well. And they had a lot of problems with the post delivering the, the, the ballot papers, etc. Um, but you can see the trust is quite high. Um, coming now to the importance of the secrecy of the vote, here you see that it is um, still 80% or in 27, 2013 it's 77% um, um, say it's important or together with a very important it's more than it's uh, over 90% think that the secrecy of the vote is very important. Uh, I think that has to do in Germany, in particular, with the experience of post-authoritarianism in the, uh, the post-war uh, period, where uh, the people are very hesitant to to disclose disclose their voting behavior. I will see that in the next um, in the next graph. Uh, people think that the secrecy of the vote is a very um, is very tricky and very important and I always um, have this anecdote of my mother which she always says when, when I ask her what are you voting for she says for the Green Party or for the Social Democrats or whatever when my father is asking her she says for the Conservative Party mm -hmm. nobody can prove that <laughs> and that's what, what I call obligatory uh, secrecy is a very important aspect and um, especially this uh, war generation or this uh, the builders are, the, this generation is very much focusing on the secrecy and for them it is very, they are very hesitant to open their uh, their, uh, their voting behavior. But you, um, that's also, you can see that here with the data, it is a little bit more that the younger generation, for them the secrecy of the vote is not so important but it's still uh, around 90%. So coming now to the um, not the last one, but there is one graph more, but this is um, on the disclosure of the vote. What you can see is um, the upper is for 2003 and the lower graph is for uh, 2013. And you can see that um, you have this kind of disclosure that the people tell um, the, the partner and within the family and sometimes also to the friends that uh, what they have voted for, but they don't do that mostly at work. Uh, for you see, in 71 percent, was it that they are not telling anybody at work what they were what they voted for? It's quite high, and ev it's even higher than 2003. And I think that has to do that. At the, we have, especially at the right spectrum, we have some new parties coming in, and of course that maybe may affect this as well. The years before, it was more in the center. So uh, some people don't tell anybody at work what they're voting for. But they do, half of them do that when there is to the partner and to the spouse. And this is very much related to data what you have in, for Norway now where you can see that people are, especially the younger generation, is much more open. But uh, it's still a very important that some of them are not, um, um, are not uh, disclosing. So if you see the data here, uh, 2013, 17% never tell it to a visit to the spouse or they probably tell don't tell the truth or any truth and then 28% um, are doing it frequently and 54 always 55% 54% always there is not a big difference between 2003 and 2013 I think that's, these are quite stable values or attitudes so coming to the um, regression just briefly, and it's also quite interesting, there is no real real, uh, real uh, um, correlation when it comes to um, the different suburbs, it's not important, age was not very important, uh, age group, gender was not important, the only important aspect was trust into postal voting. This is of course evaluation of postal voting in particular, um, where you have the um, where you can see that uh, the trust in postal voting is, uh, is um, important, but also the negative impact of the polling station, which was important. And probably that is, with this negative impact means that you have to um, 
walk to the polling station on the Sunday afternoon, and it's always on a Sunday in Germany, and uh, it doesn't fit in your uh, in your normal plans. What you plan at that uh, at that Sunday. So coming to the conclusions um, for postal voting, uh, the implementation there are no trajectories. I mean, there is um, not this kind of isomorphism, I would say, or convergent of countries where all countries go into one direction. You can see some countries like France just go into online voting now. Others, um, what we predicted is that there is a trajectory that the, p the countries start with postal voting and then those who have postal voting, uh, they start citizen abroad, a military abroad, citizen abroad, and then for everybody first for postal voting and then the same for online voting. That trajectory is, uh, is not existing. It's quite tricky. You see a lot of past dependency and electoral trauma tasks in some countries. Um, the turnout is of course a very important aspect that, but that goes down in most of the countries. And um, postal voting as well as uh, online voting doesn't have a very important um, positive effect on, on the voter turnout especially to bring back those groups who are more or less excluded nowadays. But what happens is a kind of behavioral shift. People, when it is introduced, you see that they change from the traditional way of voting more to advanced voting, especially to postal voting. When it comes to the secrecy of the vote, it can be argued if there are kind of supranational norms. I mean, is there a kind of change of values? Are they really universal values? Or is it also possible that we just have some minor cases where it happens and we just put in some penalties and say, okay, um, this is not allowed, it's not allowed to steal the ballot box and run away and stuff it. So uh, we put uh, this kind of measures to, to allow it. Because what we have nowadays is, is uh, we had that in, and uh, Rodney also went into that direction. We have some minimal incidents, especially in mature democracies like Australia where uh, all these regulations may be not so important. On the other side, I mean, there's a question mark behind it. If you have some, um, some, um, some rural um, groups like the lady on the left side, or if you have some other traditional, more traditional societies, it um, may be important to have the secrecy of the vote. And I would definitely say that um, there shouldn't be no convergence all over. It should be a different uh, trajectory in different countries. It should be different in authoritarian systems and in uh, definitely different uh, to countries which have a more mature democracy. So thank you. Thank you.